Thank you very much, Sharon. Caro Presidente Draghi. President Draghi. Mande in un minuto in inglese. First question. As you have recently recognized, money given through LTRO to Spanish banks has not arrived to real economy in terms of credit to enterprises and families. What should be done to improve the transmission mechanism of monetary policy in Spain? Second question. Considering the recapitalization of Spanish banks with EU public money, which are, in your opinion, the conditions to force a bank to close? And third question, to complete the answer of my colleague, Philip Lambert, talking about transparency, uh, when will be the ECB publish the Governing Council minutes as the Bank of Sweden, the Federal Reserve, the Bank of Japan, and the Bank of England do? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your three questions. Now, the first is about the LTRO. And with your permission, I would like, uh, I, I would like to sort of make your question even more general, uh, in a sense. Um, LTROs have been criticized for two different reasons. One is, in a sense, your, your implicit criticism that you put forward with great kindness, but is there. How come the LTRO hasn't really reached the real economy? Why can't you ask banks to do something so that they could use the money they borrow at such cheap rate from the ECB for the real economy? This was one criticism we received. The other criticism was uh, almost of the opposite sign. Ah, you cannot buy directly bonds, so you are financing banks at cheap rates so they can buy the government bonds in this way circumventing some article of, of the treaty, prohibiting the monetary financing. Now, you see, both criticisms share the same mistake, that we can actually tell the banks what they do with the money they borrow from the ECB. They assume, both criticisms, that we can actually channel this money and uh, tell the banks what they should actually do by a little of this and a little of that, but not more than that. Now, uh, this isn't, isn't possible. Isn't possible. Uh, we, uh, it's certainly very difficult at national level. Uh, it's not, I don't think it's really desirable to do in general, uh, especially for its long-term implications, but it's certainly very hard to do at uh, uh, Euro area level. You know, it's not desirable at, uh, uh, in, for the long-term implications. I agree there may be good reasons to do it if one were able to do it in the short term. But in the long term, it's not desirable. Let me give you a, a specific example that, uh, that I went through this. In the 70s, in Italy, uh, there was a concept of total internal credit. It was like a cake whereby the central bank would decide how much credit should go to governments, to the government, at subsidized rates, by the way, how much credit it should go to the private sector, how much should go to this and that part. Now, this system produced undercapitalized banks, which were forced into lending to bad clients, a politicized process of credit allocation, and ultimately 20% inflation rate. So it's, uh, having lived through that, I don't think that's a, a viable way to go in the long term. Um, but it, even, even if one were to, to go by this route, uh, one would have to have the capability of monitoring the individual banks of the euro area. Just think that in the last LTRO, there were more banks that borrowed from us. And make sure that the money they borrow would actually go to the place that you like. And this is very, very hard. Um, but let me also add another thing. Uh, this idea of intervening at the stage where the ECB lends the money to the banks would be, as I said, not desirable, but uh, could be conceivable if it were true that the LTRO didn't go into credit 
for all euro area countries. But this isn't true. For some countries, the banks that borrowed from the ECB actually lent to their real economy, to the SMEs, to the firms. For other countries, it didn't make any difference. And for some other countries, in fact, the process coincided with a steep fall in credit. Now, the explanation is that, first of all, you have certain national contractual arrangements which make credit much more difficult in some countries than in others to, mo to be mobilized. Second, in certain countries, you actually need to have banks deleveraging because they have so many bad assets on their balance sheets that they have to liquidate these assets. And so you hardly see any money going to the real economy in countries where you have this, uh, this needed deleveraging. So that's also a reason why it's very hard, because countries react in different ways to, to the same operation. But we have done something, however, in order to, uh, I can't be that negative all throughout, I mean, we've done something, however, in order to sort of try to um, increase the probability that borrowing from the ECB would actually go and finance the real economy. When we have expanded the eligibility rules for the collateral that banks could take to the ECB, we have done exactly this, in the sense that we have allowed banks to use credit claims, namely their lending to the private sector as collateral for borrowing from the ECB. So nowadays banks know that if they lend to the private sector, they would have collateral, they could borrow more from the ECB. So that's, that's a, a concrete measure that we have undertaken. It's been taken up. Of course, we have to be extremely sensitive to the amount of risks that the ECB is, the SCB is taking. I'm sorry, I, I was... I've got two was, more questions. Yes, yeah, you, You've got to say, how are you going to force banks to close and will you publish the minutes? Yeah. yeah I, I, sorry, I... <laughs> I probably answered the only question I know how to answer to, but... but uh, I've got a follow-up on that as well. <laughs> now, uh, how, do you, how do you force banks to close? Uh, right now, this is, a, in all countries nowadays, this is a process which is in the hands of, number one, the government, and number two, the supervisory entity. Traditionally, the process goes as follows. The, super, the national supervisor uh, assesses the... Uh, fact that a certain bank is not a viable concern any longer. And then the government has to decide what to do because very often this closure of banks have an impact on the national government's budget. And so this is a joint process usually. Usually the national supervisor signals to the uh, to the, to the government and to the, that part of the government that deals with banks, the need to close a certain bank, and then the government intervenes. Uh, the, finally, why don't we publish the minutes? Um, it's, it, this has been a question, I, I, I think, Sharon, you can, you can testify to this, has been a question that's been asked since the very beginning of ECB, I guess. Yeah. Or since, it, since it's been asked, certainly, from my, to my predecessor. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure I've asked it several times. You asked several yeah. times, yes. Um, it was asked to me uh, in, the, in the hearing uh, pre-appointment uh, by, by this uh, committee as well. There are, there are, there are certain good reasons. Um, we are in the euro area. We are not in a one country. We want to preserve as much as we can the independence of uh, each single governor. Uh, the governors, when they sit around the table of the ECB Governing Council, don't have the names of their institutions. They, they, they don't have Bundesbank or Banca d'Italia or Banque de France. They have their own names. They are in their personal capacity. So to some extent, the not publishing of the minutes protects this process and their independence. Also, um, there is an issue about... Um, different, I would say, communication um, strategies that different central banks have. In, 
In the United States and in the UK, the strategy is one where you publish the minutes and also you say, for example, that interest rates will stay at this level for three years' time. Uh, in the case of the ECB, the strategy of communication is different but not less transparent. It says that our objective is the price stability in the medium term for the whole of the euro area. It says that inflationary expectations have to be strongly anchored. And then it says to the market, draw from this what are the implications for interest rates and monetary policy. So these are two different ways of communicate. Uh, but we'll certainly reflect on, on your ideas and your suggestions. Thank you. I'm sorry. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Sorry, well, Sharon. Hang I'm, on. I'm just reminded that I give a lot of press conferences and speeches myself, so in a sense, yeah, yeah. the contents of the minutes is reflected in this conference, this press conference, these speeches. Thank you. Yes, we have one question. No, I think Mr. Langan is concerned that we 